Something I haven't done with us here at Willet. We need a little Bible check. Y'all got some Bibles with you? Let me see them. Come on, yeah, you can do that. All right, that's, that's pretty good. Some of y'all might have one of these things. You got a Bible on that? Yeah, yeah, some of y'all got a few of them. Now, it won't do you any good to try to place a phone call in the building here, but if you get a Bible that works offline, I think mine's called Takarta App Bible, and it does work offline, at least for the King James anyway, then those will work just fine, even though you are uh, obviously not getting a, a particular connection in here at Willette. Now, I will say this, there are some advantages and disadvantages with respect to using this as opposed to this. Uh, if you look at it from the perspective of the gizmos, that's what I call these, because you could have it on a reader like a Nook or a Kindle or a smartphone, just whatever you got it on. But if you have something on this, then you can change the type on this to be as big as you want it to be, just on the fly. So that's a positive. On the negative side, of course, is that there might still be a little bit more eye strain because you're looking at a digital thing, you're relying upon the reliability of your battery and such as that. You can look up things quicker, generally, with this. And uh, on the other hand, however, of course, uh, you have to make sure, like I said, the specific app you get because uh, some translations may not be available and you may have to pay for it. Whereas once you got this, of course, you can write in it, you know, and do all kinds of stuff. And you got a hardback Bible, which is uh, going to be easy to see to start with. And you can mark it, bookmark it, and all kinds of stuff. So whatever you're comfortable with, we want people in that Bible. Isn't that right? That's right. That's the way we believe in it. That's the way we want it here at Well Ed. And we love to have everybody to come out and always have the Word of God with them. If you see one of those pew Bibles laying around, those are always good to use. I've used one of them on many of occasion. And you just grab one right out of the pew. I love it when I go to gospel meeting and they got a pew Bible there because sometimes I don't bring my Bible with me or I've got one of a different translation or something. So I can just grab that pew Bible and there you go. It's good to go. So we love to have people have their Bibles with them. The reason I say it to you this morning is that Hebrews, the text, is what we're looking at. Hebrews chapters 1 through 8, and we're going to look at selected parts in the book of Hebrews. If you've got a Bible open to that, you are good to go this morning. You're ready to travel along and for us to quickly get an idea of the Jesus that we serve in the book of Hebrews. I'll start in on Hebrews in just a second in chapter 1. So have your finger right there. I wanted to tell you what my motivation was for preaching it this morning. If you convince somebody that they are worth something, I don't know why so many people think today that they're not worth anything or that they are not savable, but you are. I don't care who you are. Does it matter what you did? It doesn't matter. You say, well, it, yeah, it matters because I broke friendships. I ruined people's lives. I uh, wasted many years or whatever the case may be. There is nothing that cannot be spiritually fixed by God, my friend. And if you are convinced that you're worth something in the eyes of God, then you're worth more as a soul than whatever trouble you've caused yourself or anybody else in this world. Be convinced that you're worth something. But you know you're worth something and when you are, that just makes you scared for the judgment because it's like, well, wait a minute. If God hasn't forgotten me, then God knows me and everything that I have done. That means I really am going to answer for what I've done. And if I think I can be fixed, then I better get busy getting myself fixed. But who can fix me? You see, the second part of that that keeps people from coming to Jesus is not just giving them a sense of self-worth, giving them a good self-image. The second part that comes from that is convincing them that Jesus is the one who can fix it. Because whatever you've done, He is able to take care of it. But you have a hard time convincing some people that Jesus is the one, that He is able to be greater than any problems that you've ever had in life, that Jesus is able to do more than anybody else has been able to do for you. Because sometimes people get to thinking, if... Uh, good old granddad and grandmommy couldn't fix me up, then exactly what is Jesus going to do for me? If the boss at work who tried to give me a million chances couldn't fix me up and I ended up fired, then what's Jesus going to do for me? If uh, that self-help guru that I talked to and gave me a million suggestions in that little book that I bought can't help me, then how's Jesus in the Bible going to help me when he's busy helping everybody else in the world? My message to you this morning is that Jesus is not only able 
but that Jesus is better than any of those other sources, that anybody else can let you down, but Jesus will never let you down, that in the book of Hebrews you have the ultimate resource to realize the superiority, the betterness of Christ. Jesus is better. I thought about doing one of those little slide presentations, but I realized it really just have one thing on it. Jesus is better. As we go here through the book of Hebrews, Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Abraham. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. He is a better high priest. He is a better friend than anybody that you could ever have. We're going to see that this morning as we travel through the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, that is in various times and various ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Back in the old days, you wanted to know something from God, you needed to get you a seer or a prophet. And they told you what God wanted, and then you as a patriarch of the family would go and tell the family what the prophet had said. Now that was the old method. Nowadays, we got those Bibles y'all showed me just earlier. Nowadays... We have somebody who gave us that Bible and somebody that the Bible speaks of that is able to show us the real way, and that's Jesus. Hath in these last days, it says in Hebrews, spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things. Jesus inherits, Jesus receives everything. I want to be in with the guy who's got it all. I want to be in with the person who is able to say, I am successful, I can make you a success. Jesus is the inheritor of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Do you realize Jesus is better because he was there, and he invested himself and his own power, the word of his power, in making us and in making all the stuff out there. I read a news article recently. They were fascinated. They found how many worlds, it adds up now to like, I forget whether it's 400 or 4,000, like 4,000 or something so-called other planets because they see these other stars blinking, they figure there's got to be something passing in front of them. So they say, well, there's that many more planets that we've found when before we didn't know of any outside of our solar system. And I'm like, why would that be such a surprise? By whom also he made the worlds. The Lord knew that long before, didn't he? Made the whole universe made everything beautiful, made everything according to the purpose of demonstrating the glory of God. But if Jesus was able to do that and create such an expanse of glory, surely he can help us on our little neck of the woods, on this little planet. I believe he can. Because you see this Jesus. This Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. You want to know God? You want to understand God? That's kind of hard to do. Well, I want to believe that Jesus can help me, but He's up there. No, 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 my friend. God has always been up there, so to speak, but He sent Jesus for the very purpose of showing that I've got somebody who can live like you. I've got some way I can express myself to you. And my Son will come down and be with you to always be your friend. He is the express image of His person. That's what it says there in Hebrews 1 and verse 2, isn't it? He upholds all things by the word of His power. Think about what Jesus has done for us. He by Himself purged us of our sins and then sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow! Wow! Look at the description of Jesus there in verse 3. Isn't that incredible? He not only can get rid of sins, but the message of Hebrews is Jesus is better because He did it and then positioned Himself and the throne of heaven itself as King of kings and Lord of lords and says, I've got this. I will take care of you. People don't have the trust that Jesus will take care of them like they need to. The whole message of the book of Hebrews is Jesus can do it. He's better. Better than what? Well, first of all, he begins in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4 to point out that God has made him so much better than the angels. You see that key word? He's better. He's better than what, God? He's better than the angels. Jesus himself is the express reason of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
God expressed himself unto man. He said, here is my son, God in the flesh, Emmanuel. Serve him, worship him, get to know him, be a friend to him because he's a friend to you. He's going to accept all your sins and get rid of them there upon that cross. Jesus is able to do this because he is better than the angels. He spends Hebrews chapters 1 and 2 explaining how much better Jesus is than the angels. Let me talk to you for just a moment of the angels. The Bible says that they are ministering servants right here in the book of Hebrews, doesn't it? In this chapter 1. Everybody is looking for the help of an angel. The fact of the matter is, is that God says Jesus is so much better than that. One angel, if he in the Bible could destroy a whole city or group of cities, think about what one angel times thousands can do. Jesus there, when he was about to leave this earth, said, Do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father in heaven and he will deliver me more than twelve legions of angels? According to the size of a legion, you're looking at tens of thousands of angels, aren't you? You're looking at massive amounts of the power of God that Jesus wells. He commands the angels. He's better than the angels. And if everybody's looking for help from the Holy Spirit or help from angels, what does the Bible say? For he shall not speak of his own concerning the Holy Spirit, but he speaks of Jesus. He gives us the message about the Christ. Concerning the angels, Jesus once again is the one that sends them. Therefore, Jesus is made so much better than the angels. And Jesus is indeed Lord. To, who, to which one of the angels did they ever worship? They wouldn't accept worship. To which one of the angels could they say that he is the one that is, the one that God is well pleased in? You are my son, God says of Jesus. How is it I can get people to realize that Jesus can help them? Surely he's powerful enough to do it. He's better than the angels. But also, I want you to understand that God says Jesus is faithful enough to do it. You ever had a friend from like, uh, a bunch of y'all still in high school. You ever had a friend from high school and they're not so much your friend anymore, but it's not because you had a big falling out. They went their own way, didn't they? You went your way. Y'all just aren't in touch anymore. Maybe there was a falling out or something. Maybe you had a friend at work or something like that. Maybe you developed a new friend from somebody that moved into the community. People come, people go. And when they go, they lose interest in you and you lose interest in them. People have spats one with another. Here's the thing about it. Jesus is a faithful friend and Jesus will never leave you. Now what is the next one it mentions? In Hebrews chapter 2, it points out that Jesus is better than anybody else that might be an example for you, anybody that might be faithful in this life, because that can only go so far. Jesus is faithful forever. Jesus is faithful in all circumstances. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. It became Him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, like I said before, Jesus made it all. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now I'm going to come back to that idea. Jesus was made perfect through sufferings. Let that sink in with you for just a moment. Well, I didn't think Jesus ever did anything wrong. How could he be made perfect? That's because that's not what he's talking about. I'll tell you what he's talking about. Just hang on. He was made perfect through sufferings. Now, who did he serve? Who did he help in his ministry? Well, if you go down to look at verses 16 through 18 in chapter 2, to finish out the chapter, he did not take upon him the nature of angels. He took on him the seed of Abraham. Therefore, or wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Abraham was tempted. Abraham was temporary. Jesus Christ overcomes temptation. Jesus Christ is permanent. He's better than Abraham. We're going to see that later on as well. Jesus Christ, better than the angels. Jesus Christ, the best friend, the most faithful one, because he is better than Abraham. 
a better high priest, Jesus Christ, better than Moses. How many Jews out there look unto Moses? Moses can't save you. He never could save them, could he? Remember one time when the Jews messed up real bad. They messed up so bad that Moses fell down before God and he said, God, forgive them. And if you cannot forgive them, let their sin be on me. Put it on me. God turned around and he told Moses, that's not the way it works. The soul that sins, that's who it's on. You can't do this, Moses. What Moses couldn't do, Jesus can. That's one of the basic messages of the book of Hebrews. Jesus better than Moses. Because in Mount Moses, you got a guy that led the people, but the people themselves didn't always want to follow God. Jesus leads the church, and the church will always be, and the church will be victorious, and Jesus is always there ready and willing to forgive. Let's look here a little bit about what it says in Hebrews 3 about Jesus and Moses. In Hebrews 3, it says, Brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ the King then is explained in verses 3 and 4. It says, this man Moses, he was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, you see, inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honor than the house. Now, how many times had he already said in the first two chapters, by Jesus are all things and he made all things, right? Now he says, well, you got Moses. He's a faithful man in the house. I'm not taking anything away from him, but he's just somebody in the house. Jesus made the house. He ought to know how to help people that are inside that house. He can be a friend to you. I want to stop here and make a, a note for you just a moment. This note is something you can write down. It's something you can just keep in your mind however you want to do it. But if it's not Jesus that can help you out of your sins, if it's not Jesus who can take you to the day of judgment and mean your salvation, then nobody can. It's Jesus or nothing. You say, well, those Jews, they turned to Moses. I've already shown you Moses couldn't forgive anything. Not a thing. The other religions have even much less than Moses. At least Moses was faithful. But you take these other guys like Mohammed, the one the Islamists got, he didn't save anybody. What does it say in the book uh, that they use, the Quran? It says, here you got the winners, here you got the losers. And how does it tell you in the Quran how to become a winner if you're a loser? Nothing. The losers are miserably destroyed. And the winners go on uh, to whatever God wants them to have. And basically that's just it. Muhammad doesn't save anything. He's just a regular Joe that went around talking about how that God's going to miserably destroy you. Well, no wonder they go around blowing themselves up. Where's the salvation? I'm a loser. I want to be raised up to be a winner. I want God to give me the victory. And only in Jesus Christ do you find that. You're not going to find it in any other religion. You're not going to find salvation and atonement and redemption from somebody who knows they're lacking in any religion other than Christianity. Moses was a good man. But the Bible says that Jesus is better than Moses. Every house is built by some man. He that built all things is God. Verse 4, Moses was faithful in the house. Jesus built the house. He's better than Moses. Jesus is a better high priest and therefore better than Aaron. My friend, let's go on now down to Hebrews chapter 4. We travel in our journey in Hebrews chapter 4 to verses 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest which cannot, cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Wow, this passage really is impressed on me because it shows me how much of a friend Jesus is to me. He has lifted me up. The world thinks that if you are going to do something to get back right with God, you go to a special person, and that guy that may have some kind of special robe on or something with a white patch right here, or he might be designated by some fancy title, and they say, you go to them, and the priest will fix you up, or you'll give your confession to the priest. What does the Bible say? Jesus is a faithful high priest who took upon himself 
the form of a servant. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus is a faithful high priest who suffered through all the same temptations that you go through, yet without sin. Jesus, therefore, being the perfect example, lifts us up and says, guess what? I make you a priest too. Now what Peter says, I know he does. A peculiar people, a holy or royal priesthood. I'm a priest before God. When I need Jesus, I just go to the Father through Jesus Christ, and He fixes me up. Now you can't beat that. Many, many people look for somebody to give them direction, tell them what to do in life. Only in Christianity does Jesus say, I will be a friend to you to the extent that I'm the high priest. I make you to be a priest before God. You want to go to my Father? You want to ask things of Him? You want Him to help you? Do it, He says. As my child, when you ask in my name, you are a priest before God. Not only are you worth something, but God hears your petitions, and you know that you have those good things that you have asked of Him. Pray to Him. Everything will be all right. I love that. Now, you don't have that benefit until you become a child of God, do you? People wonder, what are the spiritual benefits in Jesus? You don't have the benefit of being a priest, and you go to God, but you have to go through Jesus Christ, and He hasn't yet made you a priest until you become a Christian. Now, when you approach unto God through Jesus then God is listening to you. Well, I don't feel like He's listening to me. That's because you haven't made yourself yet a friend of Jesus like you need to. So, my friend, make Jesus closer to you by realizing, first of all, what He has done for you, that He is able to help you because He is better, and thirdly, because Jesus will never give up on you. He will never forsake His promise. Have you all ever thought, and then we're going to go back to the book of Hebrews. Have you all ever thought about how you feel when you have disappointed the Lord and your, your own friends, your, the people you know, especially when you disappoint God? I don't know how you exactly identify with that. I know Jesus understands you, but I don't always understand other people. I can tell you this. I make money off of what you all just gave. And sometimes I get to thinking, I didn't get it done. This is the Lord's resources. And they're spent on me. And what did I do? And I get scared. I don't know if y'all ever get that scared feeling. I'm not ready anymore. I'm not, I, how do I know? that I have prepared myself for the judgment because uh, so much has been invested in me to be something for God, and what have I done for the Lord? Now, I'm sure many of you may be feeling the same way, either as mothers and fathers or as people who have been given talents before God, and you're like, what did I ever do with them? What have I ever done to really show that I'm thankful before God? When I get scared, what I can remember is this. The Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now I believe. I obeyed my Lord. The last part of that does not depend on Tim McHenry. Shall be saved. Who promised me that? Jesus promised me that. His word cannot be broken. My friend said, I'll take you home. There is nothing that can happen to me that he cannot fix. Therefore, I know I haven't given up on him. Therefore, he hasn't given up on me. He promised me, shall be saved. Well, Lord, I'm, I'm your child. I belong to you. So he's still there for me. Don't ever think that Jesus is not available to you. You haven't given up on him. He hasn't given up on you. The Lord waits on you. And he can always fix every problem. Because he's more powerful than the angels. He's more faithful than Abraham. He is a better man, even than the meekest one alive called Moses. He is a faithful high priest and shows us a better religion than what Aaron had. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews chapter 5, we pick up now at verse 4. 
No man takes the honor of being a priest before God. He doesn't take it to himself. But he that is called of God as was Aaron. All right, then, well, Jesus, he's just a priest, somebody that can maybe help me like Aaron. And God's like, no, he can help you so much more. Jesus wants you to understand that he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, that guy in the Bible never did have a beginning recorded. He didn't have his ending recorded. We don't know exactly when his priesthood started. We don't know anything about his priesthood ending, and that's because it really didn't. God says, Jesus is a high priest like that. He's always there for you. He will always be there. He's not going to forget the things that he has commissioned us to be, Christians, as he reigns up there in heaven. He's not going to forget on the day of judgment to forgive us and for everything to be found out to be all right with God. You know, we don't have some kind of roll of the dice on the day of judgment. Well, I've done the best I could to prepare myself. Now we'll see how it turns out. That's not the way it is, brethren. On the day of judgment, the Lord remembers those that are His. The Bible says so, doesn't it? He remembers His friends. And on that day of judgment, there is no doubt. Everyone will appear before God and you will be guilty. But when it comes to the children of God, Jesus will say, yes, guilty but forgiven, every bit of it. Nothing is remembered. The things that are old are just that. They're passed away. This is my child. We're going to take him on in. And the Father will be in agreement, and every one of our souls will be joined under the Spirit of God and will understand what it is truly like to be loved for all of eternity. Only Jesus can be that kind of a friend to you. Because Aaron tried, but that was under an old religious system. Jesus says, I've got a better way for you because I'm a better high priest. And I've got a system of religion which gives you a better law. Let's go down a little bit further now. Hebrews chapter 6, which we'll touch on in a moment, tells you to mature in Jesus Christ, develop your soul. But Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 19 tells us that we've got a better law. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. Jesus not only is a better high priest, Jesus brought in a better law, better than the law of Moses, better than the law of the United States, better than any kind of social system that might be established. Jesus is church, superintends and follows after a better system of faith wherein we have better promises, a better hope than anything you could ever get out of the world. I said before that I'd come back to the idea of perfection with you. It was mentioned earlier to us, and then now we've got this idea of Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Now see, Tim... This is why I can't get close to Jesus. I've done so many bad things. And I, 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 what did it just say? Jesus was made perfect. It's not talking about us there. That's Jesus. You say, but I don't think he ever did anything wrong to start with. I never said he did. The idea of perfection in the Bible means that Jesus can be your friend even though you've done things that are wrong because the idea of perfection is maturity, completeness. He was made perfect through sufferings. And then right here, He is perfected in His obedience, isn't He? Made perfect in His obedience. Well, I can do that kind of a thing. I can do that. Well, is it really something I can attain, though? Can I get the job done? Well, look here at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 6. God says, yeah, you can do it. Because Hebrews 6 says, Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. The Hebrew writer thought you could do it. Jesus knows you can do it because he's waiting for you. He says, I'll be a friend to you that can make you into something that you never could make yourself into. A perfect person. Completely justified on the day of judgment. Washed white in the blood of the Lamb ready to appear before God and to worship Him forevermore, ready to appear and hear the words on the great day of judgment, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. 
ready because you became a friend to Jesus. John 14, 15. You are my friend if you keep my commandments. His commandments are not grievous, not too heavy for you. He just wants you to be good. He wants you to come to Him. Whenever you have need, whenever it is you want to give praise, whenever it is that you need a true and faithful friend, the Lord says, don't forget me. Come to Him. Put all your trust in Him. You're convinced that you are made worth something before God. And you are. But that doesn't prepare you for judgment. You've got to find somebody that can fix you and present you before the Father on that day perfect for heaven. Jesus Christ is able to bring many sons unto glory. And you can be one of His children this morning. Jesus Christ not only will fix you, but He will be for you a faithful friend throughout your life never forsaking you, will be with there up until your very dying day. Who wants to be a friend to Jesus this morning? Who wants to come unto the Jesus Christ who is better and is able to save you right now from your sins? Won't you come to Him as we stand and sing?